You know, uh, when we first meet somebody um, who doesn't speak our language, our natural tendency is to start speaking slower and louder. You ever notice that? My name is, you know, whatever. And, and we think if we just speak slowly enough and loudly enough, they're going to magically understand what we're saying. We treat them as if they're hard of hearing, not lacking in English. Well, unfortunately, the same thing can happen in our relationship. One person speaks the language of quality time. My wife. One speaks the language of acts of service. Dave and me. Actually, it happened last night at the crab feed. The Lynn and I were there. Um, I love to crack the crab for her, and because she didn't really like to crack the crab, and, and and I put it on her plate, and I'm feeling I'm doing this lovely thing, and all she really wanted me to do was to be there and spend time with her. We didn't speak the same language at the time, so she ended up cracking her own crab, and everything was fine. <laughs> if you don't need, if you don't know your loved one's love language, it's hard to figure out what they are saying. We end up shouting past each other until we finally give up in frustration. Love means working to understand the, each other. Each love language communicates. You know, I've been thinking about you a lot. I understand what you care about, and I'm trying to do something about that. And I hope that you took that little quiz we handed out last week, because it helps you to understand what your love languages are. If not, I will find other copies and we'll give them to you. Uh, I think it's an important piece of relationships. Most of us have two primary love languages. So, if those of you who either took the, the quiz or know, there's, there's five love languages. Words of affirmation, physical touch, acts of service, receiving gifts, and this week's love language is quality time. So how many pr primary love languages, words of affirmation? Just out of curiosity. Just a couple of us. Okay, yeah. No wonder I like it. How about physical touch? Okay, here we go. Okay, now you should pay attention to this. Acts of service. There we go. Acts of service. Receiving gifts. A couple people are willing to say they like to get gifts. Okay, just remember, if you want to speak Vivian's love language, give her something nice. Okay, that's good. Um, how about quality time? Yeah, a lot of us have that quality time. Did you know that the average American in their lifetime will spend six months sitting at stoplights, eight months opening junk mail, one year looking for misplaced objects. For some of us, that's three to five years. And the older we get, the more years it takes. Eh. Two years unsuccessfully returning phone calls, four years doing housework, five years waiting in line, six years eating. Now, I don't know about you, but I can get the six years eating. I could extend, extend that like four years doing housework? I don't know about that. So what do you do with your time? There are 168 hours in the week. Average personal spend 56 of those hours sleeping. 24 hours in eating and taking care of personal hygiene. 50 of those hours working or traveling to and from work. That means there's 35 hours a week of what we would call discretionary time, about five hours per day. Where are you investing those hours? God says we should treasure time as a valuable commodity. We number our years, or at least some of us do. Some of us stop numbering after a certain point. But God says every day is so precious, 
we should treasure it. We, and so we are invited to treasure every moment that we have. The saying goes, yesterday is history, tomorrow's a mystery, but today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. Truth is, you can make more money, but you can't make more time. And just one more quote. No one said on their deathbed, oh, you know, I wish that I had spent more time at work. I don't think that's it. Time is more valuable than money. But like money, it can be spent and invested. But it's different than money in that it can't be saved. Time, if you don't use it, you lose it. Spending quality time, as described by Dr. Gary Chapman, who was the author of the book, The Five Love Languages, which I am basing my sermon series on, means making a, a conscious decision to be focused on making time with a loved one or loved ones. It means being together, most often without distractions, so no TV, no cell phone, no text messages, no Facebook, no internet. Oh my gosh. Nothing work related, no lost in thought, but focusing solely on the person you're with. Quality times means, let me quote Dr. Chapman here. He says, spending time genuinely with your loved ones in meaningful ways for the purpose of communicating the love you have in your heart for that person or persons. Spending quality time can mean doing things together, going out on dates, going to concerts, shopping. Shopping quality? Uh, could be. Uh, even doing projects around the house or out in the community or church work day. The key is being together. Sky's the limit. You can also spend quality time with one another by having quality conversations with each other. To speak together from the heart, again, quoting Dr. Chapman, is being willing to be vulnerable as you share what's going on in your life or how your day went or what you experienced during the movie, et cetera, whatever you experienced together. Being, doing, speaking. These are the dialects of the same love language of quality time that communicates love to another person if that is their love language. A woman sits next to an attractive man on the bus. She says, you know, you look just like my fourth husband. The man replied, fourth husband? How many times have you been married? She smiled and winked and said, three. <laughs> now, maybe that's a really good pickup line. I don't know. But for the Samaritan woman in our gospel text, our first gospel text this morning, having had five husbands and living with a man who was not her husband was no joking matter. She was a Samaritan and a woman. And culturally, Jesus had no business talking to her. But Jesus did. When others would not give her the time of day, Jesus spent quality time with the Samaritan woman. I think Jesus is probably most likely the very best model that we could have in regards to love languages of quality time. You see, quality time means that we listen for our loved one's emotions. Quality time means we give undivided attention to another. Quality time said there is, says there is nothing more important at this moment than you. Which brings us to our second gospel text, this time from Luke. Now, two sisters, Mary and Martha, both are with Jesus. Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, and 
Martha is apparently, is apparently distracted by all the work that has to be done. And so she goes and complains to, to Jesus. So she goes, hey, wait a minute. Um, Jesus, I, I'm doing all this stuff and Mary's just sitting here. To which Jesus tells Martha that Mary has chosen the better part. Hmm. So are you a Mary or are you a Martha? Do you have a Mary tendency to spend quality time with the one you love or a Martha tendency to be distracted by the tasks at hand? Now, this story is not simplistically saying Mary good, Martha bad, learning good, serving bad. Truth is, both are needed for a faithful life, aren't they? But there's one thing in this story that causes Martha to get off track. One word gives us a clue for Jesus' response. And that one word is distracted. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. I think Martha can be the patron saint of a culture that is driven to distraction. We, like her, let other things drive us rather than letting the main thing drive us. Jesus or Martha got distracted and forgot the main reason she was serving. Because you see, Jesus was the main thing. The better choice was to spend quality time with Jesus, which I'm guessing is one of his love languages, probably his primary love language. Mary spent quality time with Jesus. She sat at his feet listening to his words. That's what mattered most to him at that time. What he really wanted was quality time. Martha didn't take the time to find out what mattered more to Jesus. Mary was focused on Jesus. Martha was focused on the task at hand. Just like then, today, God wants us to spend quality time with him. During this season of Lent, we are invited and encouraged to spend quality time with God, which means we need to set aside time for God, make time for Him, make Him a priority. Which begs the question, why don't we make God a higher priority? Well, there are all sorts of reasons, I'm sure. But imagine saying any of these things to a spouse or a loved one. Things we often say to God. See how well they would fly. Oh, you know, honey, I, I just don't want to be real, uh, legalistic about it. So I'm not going to talk to you every day. Maybe when I need something from you. Or I, I can think about you, honey, in nature. When I walk through the words, I can think about you anytime. So I don't have to come home. Not every night, do I? Or, well, gosh, honey, I, I'm really busy right now. I think there'll be more time this summer when I'm not so busy. I, at least I promise to see you at Easter. Oh, and Christmas. What happens if you said that to your spouse? How would they respond? But are we really saying the same things to God when we neglect spending quality time with him? I want to close this morning with a true story, apparently, about how quality time literally made the difference between life and death for one little baby girl. Susan found out that she was pregnant, and so she did what she could to prepare her young son, Michael, for his new sibling. Well, they find out that the baby is going to be a girl, and day after day and night after night, little Michael sings to her sibling. Michael sang to his sister in his mother's tummy. The pregnancy progresses normally for Susan, and then the labor pains start. 
First every five minutes, then every minute. But complications arise during delivery. There are hours of labor. And finally, Michael's little sister is born. But she's in serious condition. The infant is rushed to the neonatal intensive care unit in the hospital. The days inch by, girl gets worse. The pediatric specialist tells the parents, you know, I'm afraid there's little hope. You need to be prepared for the worst. Susan and her husband contact a local cemetery and get information about a burial plot. They fixed up a special room in their home for their baby, and now they're planning a funeral. Meanwhile, Michael keeps pestering his parents to see his sister. She says, I just want to sing to her, he says. Week two in intensive care. Michael keeps begging his parents about singing to his sister. But you see, children aren't allowed in intensive care. Susan, seeing that there may not be much time left, decides to take Michael to be able to see his sister, maybe for the last time. So she dresses him in oversized scrubs and marches him in to the ICU. Head nurse yells, oh, I'm sorry, there's no children allowed in the ICU. Susan, who's normally mild-mannered, looks at the nurse in the eye and says, I'm not leaving until he sings to his sister. So she takes Michael to his sister's bedside. And he kind of gazes into that tiny infant's eyes, who is losing the battle to survive. And he begins to sing in a pure voice of only a child can make. Michael sings, you are my sunshine. My only sunshine, you make me happy when skies are gray. Instantly, the baby girl begins to respond. Her pulse rate becomes calm and steady. Keep on singing, Michael. His mother encourages him. You never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. The baby girl continues to improve. The other night, dear, as I lay sleeping, I dreamed I held you in my arms. Michael's little sister relaxes as healing rest sweeps over her. Keep on singing, Michael. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. Please don't take my sunshine away. Well, Michael comes and sings to his sister every day for the next few days. And amazingly, shortly thereafter, funeral, funeral plans are canceled, and the little girl is well enough to go home. That's the power of quality time, of undivided attention. When we offer quality time, we are declaring to the other, you are my sunshine whether it be to a loved one or to God. Now, Michael knew this. Jesus knew this. My wife knows this. May we know it too. This Lenten season, may we make quality time for all those who have that as one of their love languages maybe even for those who don't. Amen.